I think this is going to be the last class for uh, our, our confession of faith. I was going over my notes, and I, I think I can probably, without rushing, get through chapter 32. Now, cha- we, last week we looked at 31, and this week we'll look at 32, and both of these chapters are closely related because one is, deals with the state of man after death and the resurrection of the dead, and then chapter 32 deals more with the, the, the last judgment. And so last week, just, just to bring you kind of up to par with what we're looking at, in, our, in chapter 31, we looked at last week, we saw that when man dies, there's a separation of his soul from his body. The body decays and rots in a tomb where the soul goes before God for either reward or punishment. We saw that last week in Luke 16, how our Lord showed a difference And that one was inescapable. Both of them are inescapable of where they are going. And um, the the soul is in a a state of what our confession called immortal substance. substance. And immortal would mean that that soul never dies. Substance means that it continues on. it, It continues existing. And so that's the difference between our bodies and our soul. But then our confession said at the last day, those two, they get together. They finally come together in a self-same body. For the believer, it is to honor, so it's not in a condition of, of, of being a uh, condition of sin, but it's a condition of honor where the unbeliever is reunited with his body, but it's dishonor, which is judgment. And in our confession, it, it showed the believer when they die, um, they are made perfect in holiness. In other words, they're never going to sin again. Secondly, they are received into paradise, that happy place known as heaven. Thirdly, they are with Christ, so they maintain communion with Christ. As Christ said to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. And they behold the face of God, book of Revelation says, and they shall see his face. So that's what we looked at last week. That is a really quick summary of what we looked at. I do want to mention this because our confession mentioned this, is that there is no purgatory and uh, it makes that statement that scripture acknowledges no other place where souls and bodies are separated except heaven or hell. And so today we're in chapter 32 and there are three paragraphs and I will read the first one. And it says, God has appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father. Okay, so that's the first part. And then the second part, in which day not only the apostate angels shall be judged, we'll look at that briefly, what that means, but likewise all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ, and then they will have to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. So that's our first chapter, first paragraph, I should say, in paragraph 32. So God has appointed, from what we can see in this first paragraph, he's appointed a day, not a year or a thousand years, but one day for final judgment of the living and the dead. In other words, all the world will be judged in one day. We have John 5, 22 and 27, Kirk. Okay, so it's committed all judgment to the Son, continues on with his discourse, and he finishes it in 27. And have given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Okay, so Christ is the one that will make that judgment. We have Acts 17, 30 through 31. This is Paul when he's preaching to the, uh, the Gentiles on Mars Hill, and they were involved in their idolatry. And he's giving them the doctrine of God, the doctrine of judgment. And now we have 30 through 31 of Acts 17. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man who he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There's a lot of proofs of our Lord being raised from the dead and reasons for it. And one of it is to show that he will judge the living and the dead because he's conquered hell and death. And this judgment is at Christ's second coming. 
His coming is described in God's word, and we will see various passages in God's word where, where Christ's second coming is one cataclysmic event, not two. I was taught early on in my Christian experience that the Lord comes back, raptures the church. There's a rapture of the church, definitely a rapture of the church. But then there's a seven-year tribulation period. And then after that, there's a judgment. And then after that, there's a thousand-year reign of Christ. And then after that, then you have the final judgment. And our confession knows nothing of that. And I would submit to you the scriptures know nothing of that as well. When you look at Matthew 16, there's a couple of passages I'll read. Matthew 16, 27 for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then, okay, so when is that? It's at his second coming. Then he will reward each according to his works. When you turn over to 25, and we're real familiar, most of you I'm sure are familiar with Matthew 25. This is the separation of the sheep and the goats, the separation of the nations. In verse 31 of chapter 25 of Matthew, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed are my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. So our Lord is being very detailed about that last day judgment. And then uh, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you a drink? It's almost as if they're saying... We fed a lot of people, Lord. We, we took in a lot of people. Where were you in this mix of people? When do we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It appears to be that one day, that one judgment, the separation of the sheep and the goats or God's people from those who are not God's people. Then we go over to Second Thessalonians, which um, Brother George brought out in our uh, day of prayer and fasting. And in, when you look at verse 3, this is a church that's heavily persecuted. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward everyone. They were ministering to one another in spite of the fact that they were being heavily persecuted. Uh, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest or shown evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels when in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. In Second Peter, now you may be saying, Rick, you're really pounding the point here and you're using a lot of scripture. It's just... It's a very common teaching in the, in the churches these days of these two or three events taking our Lord's return and slicing into two or three events. The hermeneutics is bad. And so you have 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 
But the day of the Lord, notice the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. There's no seven years. It happens right then and there. The Lord comes back and that's it. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. So we're looking forward to that one day. The book of Revelation obviously talks about the, the great white throne judgment where the Lord will separate the nations for himself. We'll read that later on. So our confession, pretty clear. I think the word of God is very clear. That it is one cataclysmic event. There's a general judgment, one judgment, and it occurs at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now our confession mentions something here too as well in regards to the... Um, the day of judgment is given to the Father, in which day not only the apostate angels shall be judged, so it's, it's parenthetical right here, and we have two passages that, that talks about judging angels. We have 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Craig? I think I gave that one to you. And Jude 6. Okay, so there's going to be a judgment of the angels that have fallen, which have become devils. Now, how will this be done? Well, all we know is that we are there with Christ. It is safe to assume that the necessary information and how everything will work out is up to our Lord. There's no need to speculate about this. The scriptures are silent on how that judgment goes about, how we will judge angels, uh, because this is not the day of judgment. This is the day for us to make our calling and election sure. So we leave that with God. We simply leave that with God. It's in our confession. It's in the scriptures. We leave that judgment to God. Granted, it's already said that we will judge angels. Okay, fine. We're not judging him now, so we leave it at that. Who else will be judged? Our confession says, not only the apostate angels, but likewise all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. Well, it appears from our confession that it's all persons who have lived on the earth the Christian need not dread that day since we have passed from death into life and shall not come into judgment. The Christian is everything to look forward to in that day of judgment. He views that day with sobriety, though. He must. We never are to take lightly the judgment of God, ever, as Christians. We look upon it soberly, but we look upon it with great hope. It's an anchor for our soul because our advocate will be there that will, get, that will pr protect us and we are freely justified in the sight of God. However, the wicked are not so. They have everything to fear. The ungodly will have to answer for their thoughts, words, and deeds. We have Matthew 12, 36, 37. I gave that to someone. Mark, go ahead. By your words, you'll be justified. In other words, we're going to be there giving an account to God as well because by our words, we will be justified. We have professed faith in Jesus Christ. Our, our lawless deeds and sins will not be brought up at that time. It's a time of reward, but it's also a time where it's, it's verified. Yes, there was a profession of faith in Christ by our words as well as by our actions, those actions not being meritorious. But we also have the wicked being condemned for all that they have done. We have uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Did I give that to anyone? Chuck, go right ahead. 9 and 10. I, yes, sir. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 
Okay, so the context, obviously, he's writing to a church. He's telling the church to abound in good works. Why? Because of the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before Christ on that last day, and we have to give an account. Now, giving an account is one thing. Being judged and condemned is another. That doesn't happen to the Christian. And it's not as if our good works are going to outweigh our bad works. That's going to get us into heaven. We are saved by the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the teaching of Scripture. But for Paul here to teach the church here, remember, okay, we should abound in good works. We have to stand before Jesus Christ one day and give an account of our deeds while in the body. Now, I, uh, I read Hodge and Gill on the body, and it's basically our physical body that would appear to be with the context of that particular verse. So while we're living here in this tent, we have to give an account for the things that are done in the body. The believer, though, is, is condemned. The sins of the believer are not offset by his good deeds, as I mentioned, because our, our sins have been cast away because of the blood and righteousness of Christ as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again and never to be brought back up again as well. So the believer need not fear that any of his worthless deeds will be exposed. But we do have to give an account. That's, that's, that's the balance I would be unfaithful to to say, you have to give an account about anything you have to, that you're going to do in this life. I would be wrong. Second Corinthians brings that out. Now, Paragraph 2, our confession reiterates the doctrine of endless torment to the wicked. I mentioned this last week. Uh, our confession uses three terms, eternal damnation, everlasting torments, and everlasting destruction. It says here in, in paragraph 2, the end of God's appointment or appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy and the eternal salvation of the elect. So before we even get to eternal damnation, everlasting torment, and everlasting destruction, okay, we see the mercy of God is displayed in eternal salvation for the elect. Uh, Kyle, why don't you read 9, 22 and through 23? So here we have the two classes of people, God demonstrating his justice in the damnation of sinners and demonstrating his mercy in the salvation of sinners. I'll continue reading in our confession. Point of the day, manifestation of the glory of his mercy and the eternal salvation of the elect and of his justice in the eternal damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient. For, they, for then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive the fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord. But the wicked who know not God, obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, shall be cast aside into everlasting torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we have God's display of mercy in the elect receiving eternal life through Jesus Christ. But then we have the damnation of the reprobate. And what are their characteristics? They are wicked and disobedient. Or in other words, they are unrepentant and unbelieving. This paragraph goes against universalism, that all men will be saved. Or, annihil or annihilationism, or uh, uh, the one who holds to annihilation, which would be the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think the... Um, Oh, what is Seventh-day Adventists hold to annihilationism as well, where there's, there's no existence. They just cease to exist. But our confession shows that there is everlasting torments. We have Matthew 18.8. Did I give that to anyone? Don. Keyword is eternal fire, something that continues on and on and on. You read through the book of Revelation, and we'll see this as well as we get near the end of this. Their, their punishment is unending. And some argue that since God is a God of love, they just cannot fathom him punishing people forever for eternity. And it would not appear to be, you know, within the scope of what they know of God. Um, it's best... On this side of eternity, for us to believe God's truth, 
We should flee from the wrath to come by faith in Jesus Christ and repentance unto life. And we leave the judgment in God's hands about how long the duration is. It's best for us to stick with the word of God, when we, especially when we look at the issue of eternal condemnation. We live in a fallen world. We even have fallen natures, and our reason is not perfect. And so we have to trust God's word. And to go beyond the bounds of truth would not be safe. Uh, the claims of endless punishment are asserted from Scripture. They're emphasized by our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a parallel to the righteous receiving endless or everlasting joy. And then conversely, the wicked have to receive everlasting contempt. I'm going to read from um, Matthew chapter 13. We just looked at Matthew 13 earlier, but we're going to look at something a little bit differently. You look at verse 36 of Matthew 13. It's about the parable of the, of the tares. And uh, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. He just got done telling them about the, the, the uh, parable of the tares and the wheat, but he didn't explain it. He didn't explain it. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And the answer is sent to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So there's a difference here between the wicked and the righteous. The enemy who sow them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And again, to bring out the Luke 16 passage, which we looked at last week, has got to be inserted here as well. We had the death of Lazarus, death of the rich man. Lazarus is comforted. The rich man is in torments. He cannot get out of that place. It is everlasting. It is endless uh, damnation by God Almighty. So, I mean, I know that the, I'm, I'm sure that the heart of every one of us would want everyone to go to heaven. But there's got to be a hell. As part of God's justice, there's got to be a hell. And that's part of his character as well. Paragraph three, I want to deal with another issue. And that is, as Christ would have us to be certainly persuaded that there shall be a day of judgment both to deter all men from sin, to restrain men from sin, and for the greater consolation of the godly in their adversity. We saw that in the Second Thessalonians passage. So will he have the day unknown to men, that day when he's going to return, that they may shake off all carnal security and be always watchful because they know not at what hour the Lord will come and may ever be prepared to say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. And that's the last word of our confession. Paragraph three, Christ would have us persuaded that there is a day of judgment to come. He is persuaded to have all men to know that there's a judgment to come because it does indeed. The judgment to come restrains men wickedness. It keeps them in bounds. It restrains their sins against God and against men. Because God has given men two truths at birth. And those two are truths is that there's a God and there's a judgment. All you have to do, the scriptures verify this, but all you have to do is just listen to men and how they talk. How they take God's name in vain and put a damn at the end of it. Or to hell with this, they say. They take it lightly. Men know that there is a heaven and a hell and there's a God. I was talking to this man at the gym, of course, and um, he was saying, oh, there's no such thing as this. I said, yeah, there is. Just listen to your... There's a God. Listen to, your, listen to your language. You take God's name in vain all the time. And you use damn all the time. So you know there's a hell. There's a judgment. I said, there's got to be a hell. Okay, all right. You know, that type of thing. But that's, men know that. They know that, they are, that there's a God that they have to give an account to. And you see that even in movies and in literature, how they portray hell and heaven. They, they have a knowledge of it. It's not according to knowledge. And they have a knowledge of God. They do not give glory to God. 
But it's not, it's, it's more to condemn them more than anything, that there is a God and that there is a judgment. So our confession here asserts that, that it is to restrain men. It's also a day of judgment to comfort God's people during their times of tribulation. We see that, and I'm going to read that again. George again read that. I'm going to read it again. It's to give us comfort. Whether it is physical difficulties we're going through, uh, whether it is being persecuted by family and friends, our persecution not in the blood anymore. It's more, you know, what's the family going to think of me? Or what are my friends going to think of me? It, it's, it's, it's different. The devil's devices are a little bit different now than they were before, but it's still an issue of persecution that the Christian has to endure. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, Christians suffer, which is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus revealed, was revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So there is the comfort of the Christian. We are to be comforted that in this life we will have tribulation, but we are to be of good cheer because the Lord Jesus has overcome the world. And that day of judgment is something that should be feared by the ungodly. But for the righteous, we look forward to that, where we will be comforted by the Lord. Be, we will not be sinning anymore. The persecutions that we have will not happen. The Psalms, the Psalms talked about looking for the wicked and you can't find them in that great day of, of glory. That will be taken away, the, the, the difficulties that Christians go through. But there's also another command regarding our Lord's second coming. It's a truth asserted, and that's no man knows the day of our Lord's return. In Luke chapter 12, Thirty-five. Our Lord gives a command to his disciples, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. In other words, always be ready. Don't be standing on the mountain looking up into the heavens thinking you've got the day figured out. So let your waist be girded, your lamps be burning. You yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. As surely I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. He will come in the second watch or the third watch. Uh, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, not allowed his house to be broken into. Something our Lord said, watch and pray. Psalmist says, watch. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, Harold Camping claimed to have the day down. And, and this is a reformed man, and he predicted the day of our Lord's second coming. Go out and bet, put as much money as you can on that because you can guarantee the Lord's not coming back that day. We had the great disappointment of 1893 and 94 and 95 by the Seventh Day Adventists. We have the um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses predicting that day, and the Mormons, and many have predicted that day, even those within the, the, the veil of Christendom. And this goes completely contrary to what Christ had predicted, that no one knows that day. Many have erred in that day. And you may think or ask the question, why is it the Lord has kept that secret from us? Well, God's God. He knows what's best for us, doesn't he? Don't we put our trust in him? that those secret things belong to him and those things that he's revealed to us, that's for us and for our children. We may do all of his words. And that's the safety right there. Also, there's a tendency for us to be lazy or carnal security is what our confession uses. What would we do if we knew the exact day that the Lord would be coming back, standing up on a mountain instead of doing our jobs, whatever our jobs and responsibility that God would have us to do, that's what we would be doing. That's just some of those that we're doing for camping. I remember getting a call from a, from a brother. I believe he's a brother. And he says, what are you doing on this particular day? I said, well, I'm going to work. He says, I'm going up on a mountain. I said, you're a fool. You're going to be a fool. The Lord's not coming back then. And he didn't. The Lord did not come back then because no man knows the hour. And so there's a tendency for us to be lazy, whereas we should be diligent, waiting for and hastening the coming of the Lord 
And it's also for our prayers. We should end our prayers. Lord Jesus, come back quickly. That's how our Bibles end. When you look at Revelation 22, you can turn there or listen. I'm going to read an extensive portion here from Revelation chapter 22. And behold, I am coming quickly, in verse 12, and my, re- and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whatever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And thus ends... This part of our confession. In conclusion, this is our last class on the confession. Our confession is a protection from false teachers since it is our system of theology. Everyone has a system of theology. Whether they admit it or not, everything is governed by what they believe regarding God. Some systems are not safe. I came out of the Roman Catholic system. That was not safe. We had the Baltimore Catechism, the Council of Trent. Those systems were not safe. They could have condemned me if it wasn't for the mercy of God. So, this is to cause us, our confession of faith is that we might increase in in faith. We might increase in truth and in doctrine and in practice and love to our Lord as well as love for one another, for our brethren. We live in perilous times where truth is not supreme. But it's man's praise, man's agenda. The Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is building his church, and we are to enjoy these truths that are deposited to us here in the confession, which directs us to the word of God, directs us to pray daily, directs us to be upon daily pursuit of holiness, because without it, no one will see the Lord. And so as we walk by the faith, we walk by faith and not by sight, and thankfully, we have a confession of faith, that is meant to be for our protection. When I first joined this church, before I joined the church, I got to read this confession of faith. Some of the things I did not understand, but I thought, okay, I'm, that doesn't mean I'm not going to join the church. I'm going to keep reading, keep going through it. I want to join the church, and my pastors at the time, I trust, will help me to, to come along in the most holy faith. Because those essential things were found here in the scripture with regards to the doctrine of God, regarding the scriptures, regarding the fall of man the person and work of Jesus Christ, eternal security, the atonement of Christ, and last things, his second coming. So I trust this might be of help to us. Do you have any questions here? We have about five minutes. Vishal. Right. You're talking about paragraph two. and Okay, go, go ahead. You know, I was reading Samuel Aldrin, and he didn't mention that at all. Normally, whenever he um, sees a, I don't know if conflict is the right word, but a difference between the, the, the Savoy and the Westminster. Savoy is the, the congregational system of theology. The Westminster is the Presbyterian, if you will, uh, and ours is, is Baptistic. And he didn't see that there was any conflict there. He didn't bring it up. 
And maybe I'll ask him when I see him next time, you know, God willing to see him, I may ask him that. But I don't know if, if uh, they, because I know that the Westminster and the Savoy definitely held to eternal torment, uh, endless, um, hell being endless. I know that they held that. So I don't know why the Westminster in that particular case didn't mention that at all. So I don't know. But, I'm, you know, if Sam Waldron's here, if I know he's going to be teaching at Orange or something like that, I'll let you know. You or I can ask him and see what he thinks. Any other? Yes, Craig. The confession doesn't uh, make mention of the differences in the severity of judgment. Correct. That God will meet out on the wicked. Correct. Right, it doesn't. It doesn't make it. What it shows is that the in, a, in the general judgment, the righteous receive endless joys with their Lord. The wicked, though, eternal condemnation. Now, the only passage we have is the Luke passage, which our Lord says they will be beaten with less stripes. Some would be beaten with more stripes. So it would appear that the eternal judgment it has a degree. And what that degree is, I'm not sure, because our Lord, even our Lord's um, uh, parable, if you will, or his, his speech right there is somewhat metaphorical, beaten with strife. You know that men are not literally beaten with strife, but we know that there is torments that are going on, and it's going to be based upon degrees. Because the, the one who's heard much, let's say someone has professed faith in Christ, they've joined a church, and they fall away. Like Peter said, it would be better for them not to have known than to have known. Why? Because their judgment is much more severe than the one who never heard and is condemned because of his sin. There, there's a degree of torment there based upon what one does, what one has not done. So our, our, to answer your question, the confession doesn't make that separation. But I think it's